so now we talk about uh, non-volatile memories uh, the definition of a non-volatile memory is uh, a memory that is able to store the information also when uh, the power supply is removed okay uh, from the um, commercial point of view uh, there is uh, a now a typical 10 year retention time so memory they want to be sold as non-volatile <coughs> memories have to uh, ensure a 10 year retention time of the information and as of now at least uh, a number of um, cycles of uh, program and erase of the memory of at least 10 to the 5 to the power of 5 uh, write erase cycles 10 to the 5th power right so please consider these are uh, just commercial uh, requirements uh, they can change in time and uh, they can change with the type of use that is done of the memories the, the most common use of non-volatile memories in this moment is the use in flashcards for example for um, digital cameras or for USB sticks And uh, as of now, I mean, the most recent one, and uh, in terms of volume, mm, I would say now the most important one is the use in solid state disks. Solid state disks. As you know, solid state disks are gradually completely replacing the hard disk drive, the magnetic disk drives. They have a huge advantage in terms of uh, uh, reliability, in terms of power consumption, and in terms of speed. And these are the three reasons according to which they are replacing hard disk drives. They also have uh, some drawbacks with respect to hard disk drives, and the main drawback is the cost, because at the moment they are much more expensive. And the second part is the number of write erase cycles. Because for a magnetic disk, uh, the number of write erase cycles is something like 10 to the 9, 10 to the power of 9. So it's, I mean, it's much more uh, usable from that point of view. But of course, on the other hand, it's less reliable because, as anybody <laughs> knows, hard disk drives can break down. Okay. Uh, Typically, these uh, flashcards are based on a specific architecture for non-volatile memories that is called NAND architecture. It's not the only one, but it's the one that now in volume is the most important. We shall see in, uh, in a few minutes uh, uh, what is the um, w w what are the main properties of this type of architecture. Um, okay, I'm not going to uh, discuss the history of uh, uh, non-volatile non flash memories. I'm only starting with uh, showing you the typical. Um, flash memory, modern flash memory, okay? It is basically a single MOSFET with two gates. So I can draw the cross-section on, on the wafer. Let's assume that it's an N-type MOSFET. So it's an N-type MOSFET.
with two gates. One gate is called control gate and it is um, it's a connected to the gate electrode to an, to an external gate electrode and then there is an additional gate which is a floating gate floating means that it is not connected to any external electrode and indeed the floating gate is the component of the uh, flash memory cell that stores the information so I'm going I'm going slowly here because you have seen the, 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 the type of devices but probably you did it some time ago basically this is the basic MOSFET structure let's assume that this is the source and this is the drain here we have an N plus diffusion region for the contact and then there is first the electric layer then on top of it there is a polysilicon layer this is a poly 1 layer and it is also the floating gate so the first layer of polysilicon then there is another layer of the electric material which is an insul uh, which means an insulator the electric means insulator and then on top of it a second layer of polysilicon wh which we call poly2 and this is the control gate here we have the gate contact so uh, let, let me use this other you have seen the basic structure also in the basic electronic course in, during the, the third year of the uh, first Lyra degree but let me just go through it slowly this is the control gate this is the floating gate Uh, again you have uh, the um, three terminals one with the gate the source and the drain as you also know the M M M MOSFET in, in, in fact has uh, four terminals because also the, the body the, the is uh, has to be contacted somewhat and indeed uh, if you want to explicitly show the fourth terminal we typically have this situation we have that also the P region is individually contacted through a P plus diffusion this is the electrode which is called B, the body everything is in a P well for example in many situations the source is contacted with the body so the two voltages are the same okay um, what is important to show here looking at everything from above I have this situation this is uh, uh, if I want to show also the body contact this is the uh, active region this is the contact one and two let me write here top view and then here you have the poly you have the poly two on top of everything and the poly one I draw it below is uh, essentially an island this uh, uh, this this, uh, 
this rectangular region inside here is the poly one so you can see b basically the poly the poly one is an island which is uh, uh, immersed in an in in a, an insulating region so it's comp el from the elliptical point of view is disconnected with anything in in i mean technically you call it floating when these things happen the poly 2 instead is basically the word line so you have the, this long line of poly 2 which goes through all flash memory cells so let also you write this this is also the word line and this con this poly 2 here is also the word line okay uh, this is not a nice drawing one, one should do it in the scale and typically the width of the polyline is the minimum width uh, also the, the the size of the contact is the minimum size of the contact and the length and the gate length which is uh, the yeah this, this the gate length and the gate width are the minimum dimensions possible for that specific technology because the main uh, uh, let's say uh, the main uh, objective here is to make the memory cell as small as possible and to pack as many as possible memory cells in a single chip so uh, everybody is going to minimum to minimum feature size for for every cell so I just draw, draw it drew it a little bit larger to to, I mean, to, to, to to be able to write something in it but it is actually uh, pretty small there's a symbol for the flash memory cell that is pretty uh, clear because it is basically the symbol of uh, a MOSFET with uh, an additional floating gate in the middle of course this region one two and three symbolize the control gate the floating gate and the channel you have three parallel lines here okay let's look at uh, um, at the um, electrical point of view and the, the operational point of view uh, where is the information stored basically a memory cell has at least two states if you want to uh, memorize a zero or a one and uh, the typical situation is that uh, the cell is storing zero when the floating gate is empty and the cell is storing a one when the floating gate is uh, full of electrons uh, what does full of electrons means uh, for a normal modern uh, flash memory cells full of electrons means less than a hundred electrons in the floating gate because the cell is so small that then something like 50 60 electrons are sufficient to change the state okay uh, why the flash memory is non-volatile because the floating gate is completely insulated from the rest of the device and therefore if you are able to put electrons in the floating gate they can stay there for 10 years unless you intentionally remove them okay this is the operation now the main distinction be between different types of flash memory cells is in how you put electrons in the floating gate and how you remove electrons from the floating gate but the typical uh, operation is uh, I I I is very simple so from the from the point of view of the logic the information is physically stored in the charge that is present in the floating gate zero charge means zero charge q let's say means one you know that in the magnetic memory the information is stored in the orientation of the magnetization and there are different types of memory in which you typically in a memory you have to encode 
the information in some physical property of the memory cell. Uh, OK. There is also an additional issue. Once you have decided how to encode the information in the memory cell, you have to understand how to read the information. You need to understand how to write, how to erase, and how to read the information. And in this case, it can easily be done electrically. OK, let's look at the um, situation from the electrical point of view. How can you, uh, let's say, describe from the electrical point of view this uh, uh, device? OK, one possibility to describe it is basically to show, to say, OK, I have a normal MOSFET here. Oops, sorry normal MOSFET here, plus a capacitance on the gate between poly 1 and poly 2. Because you ha I have two layers which are one on top of the other, so I essentially have a parallel plate capacitor. OK? So let me just So I can write it like this. This is the control gate, control gate, and this in the middle here is the floating gate. Okay. Of course, I do not have current flowing through this capacitor. I do not have DC current flowing through the capacitor because the capacitor is uh, an open circuit for the DC current. But then what I can say is, is let's assume that I can uh, apply a voltage here on the control gate. Let me, let me write it to, to be consistent. VCG, the voltage of the control gate. I have a drain here. I have a source here. I can put it uh, uh, at ground for simplicity so that I have that uh, VGS uh, okay VCG is the voltage between the control gate and the source because the source has a, a zero voltage and I can draw the transfer characteristics of the MOSFET these are transfer characteristics characteristics in Italian would be caratteristiche di trasferimento uh, I have to by definition to plot the drain current as a function of the gate voltage which in this case is VCG okay then uh, for a given VDS VDS has to be fixed. Of course, the presence of the capacitor does not change very much. If I have, uh, because uh, essentially what I have here is that I have, from the point of view of the electrical behavior of this capacitor, I have a capacitor between the control gate and the floating gate, and then I have another capacitor which is the C ox, the capacitor of the oxide between the floating gate and the channel. So that the, these two capacitors in series are equivalent to a unique capacitor, and then the behavior is that of a normal MOSFET. I have something like this. I have a VT here, VT. Let, let, let's call it VT0 because I'm assuming that I have no charge here in the floating gate and uh, logically I have related this situation to a zero and then of course when the voltage on the control gate is above the threshold voltage I have a parabolic behavior of the current you remember that the, the current in a MOSFET is proportional to the to the square of the overdrive so vcg minus vt0 to the second power 
this is the sign of proportionality okay now let's consider the different situation in which i have uh, some charge here okay let me use a different color so now there is q in fg so what does it mean here if i have In order to understand everything, you need to compare with the situation that we had before. Basically, let's, uh, let's assume for the moment that we have the same charge in the channel that we had in the previous case. And let's look at what different voltage we need on the control gate in order to, uh, to be in the same situation as far as the charges in the channel is concerned. So if i have the same charge here in the channel that here it means that on this side let, let, let me call it c qc the charge in the channel this means that i have the same current through the device okay if i have a charge minus qc in the channel here it's minus because in, it's an n mosfet so i have uh, electrons that are negative i would have here a charge which is plus QC on this side and also here I have minus QC and I have here plus QC but then since the floating gate is, I, I, the floating gate is uh, overall neutral if I have a charge plus QC on this plate of the capacitor it means that I have a charge which is minus QC on the other plate of the capacitor so that the floating gate is uh, overall neutral and then I have a charge which is plus QC on the other plate of the um, second capacitor this would be the situation before in this case what I have is something different I have uh, I have okay I have here minus QC and plus QC here then when I have this plus QC in this region since the overall charge in the floating gate is Q I need to have a minus QC in on this other side at on this capacitance I need to have since the overall charge is minus qc plus q plus q i have to have something like qc minus q on this part so that overall the structure is neutral the situation is that the additional charge that i have in the floating gate is compensated by the, a charge on the other plate of the capacitor on the node of the control gate Okay, this is the difference from here to here. If you look at the voltage, at the voltage different, let's call this CG, this capacitance, let's call this CG. You see that the only difference is that the voltage on this capacitor with respect to the voltage on uh, so sorry the voltage on this control gate with respect to the voltage on this other control gate is given by the fact that here you need to have more charge on the two plates and therefore you have a voltage difference delta v t delta v which is this q over cg so let me repeat this concept if you want to have the same charge in the channel which is the same current in the device in the second case you have to apply an additional voltage on the control gate which is equal to Q over CG 
okay? So, in this case, when you have a logic 1, if you want to have the same current, you need to apply a voltage which is delta, delta V larger for each current. So basically, the uh, transfer characteristics is just translated with respect to the previous one by a quantity which is equal to delta V. So this is a one logic and this is a logic zero. So one has to know in order to program the memory, or let's say, what is the voltage shift that is, ne that is needed, that one wants, and then according to that, one must put the proper charge given by that relation in the floating gate. How do you read the information? There are two ways of reading the information in a memory such as this one. You typically, you typically can apply a certain voltage on the gate, for example this one, and measure the current. If, if you have a zero, you measure a relatively large current. If you have a one in the memory, you measure more or less a zero current. This is one way of reading the information. The other way that actually is more common of reading the information is to push a given current through the memory and to read the voltage on the gate. If you push a certain current on the memory, then on the gate moves here or moves here, and then you can discriminate between the two positions. Okay. There is also, there's also a third way, which is actually the most common one now, but uh, I, I will discuss it later. You can uh, essentially you, you read the memory electrically. You push a voltage or you push a current and then you read the other quantity, which is different depending on the logic state of the memory cell. Okay. Um, now, this is the basic mechanism. Uh, I, I, I already mentioned the fact that as of now, this Q is more or less is negative and is something like 50, 60 electrons. It's very it's a very small number and you can imagine it's not easy to be able to put 60 electrons there because you have to do it routinely for gigabytes of memory but it is actually done and also in numbers smaller than that as i will show you in in, in a minute okay how do you program uh, the memory which means how do you put the charge in the floating gate now, in times th there have been many mechanisms, I will show you the main two ones. Uh, one is, so, program operation. <coughs> one mechanism is called CHE, which means channel hot electrons channel hot electrons this is a mechanism uh, let's say the, the, the initial one the most common at the beginning at least in order to uh, program the memory and uh, it's a fairly simple what you do essentially is this thing you bias the cell this is the source this is the drain
so you, you bias the cell in this way you actually put Vs to 0 in VD you put something like uh, 5 volts okay just an example and VG this is about uh, let's say 10 volts okay these are reasonable typical numbers no, not really uh, high but not, not as low as the uh, values for the voltage supply that you typically have uh, in uh, an advanced uh, logic uh, advanced logic circuit now because now you typically have uh, a microprocessor which operates with one volt of supply voltage but if you want to program a non-volatile memory you need uh, uh, let's say higher voltages and what happens is the following basically when you program uh, when you put this bias on the memory cell you actually switch the device on uh, when you have 10 volts on the gate uh, you are in uh, in strong inversion so you have a channel here which of course as in the case of MOSFET is uh, uh, more populated close to the source and less populated close to the drain now let let us look at the electrons the individual electrons do the following thing okay let me see okay I am an electron here let, let's look at everything from the point of view of the electron I feel a field which is pushing towards the drain because the drain it it's is at the higher voltage so I feel a force in this direction the electron gets accelerated towards the drain and at some point it scatters basically it um, uh, bounces uh, on an impurity or on another electron or with a vibration of the crystal anything can happen in this region and when it bounces there's a there's a good probability that because the gate is at the at, at an even higher uh, voltage the electron goes in this direction actually it goes everywhere but uh, I mean it, it's like a, a tilted plane the, in, the, in the direction of the gate you also have an additional force pushing the electron in that direction and what happens is that many electrons have sufficient energy to go through the dielectric by an effect which in physics is called tunneling typically and then when it goes through the, 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 the electric, reaches the poly 1, loses some energy and stays there. Okay? So this is a process which is not really effective. You need to let a lot of current flow from source to drain in order to put some electrons in the gate. Okay? It's not typically 1-2% of the overall number of electrons that go from source to drain actually get trapped into the poly but this is how you store some information okay and now one, uh, this is also the reason why you need such high voltages because you need a lot of energy in order to go through the the electric and then since the electrons then lose the energy they they have never enough energy to go out so that they can stay there for the typical 10 years okay so this energy is uh, is uh, required because you then want to store the electrons for for lot for, for for 10 years so the, the the electric layers are not too thin are significantly uh, thick something like eight nine nanometers and then in order to go through them you need to have a high energy of the electrons so you need to apply high voltages on the drain and on the gate okay this is important because you you see that in a no, in, for example in a, also in a, in a smartphone you have a battery which which has a voltage of 3.7 volt a lithium but normal lithium battery but of course you need several different voltages you need one volt for using it as a voltage supply for the microprocessor then you need 5 volt and 10 volts for the 
flash memory and all the other voltage values and then you need also the proper circuits that are able to provide all these different voltages okay uh, right okay how do you remove them I can go back. <coughs> oh no, let me let me just write another f first another method to program which is called FN tunneling. This is the second method which this FN it's called Fowler Nordheim tunneling. Fuller and Erdheim were physicists of the um, of the thirties that actually uh, uh, investigated for the first time this this type of tunneling. Uh, in this case, the situation is pretty simple. Uh, let me draw again the memory. You need, uh, um, as you shall see, is a method that is more efficient but slower. Let me show you how it is and why it is more efficient more, but slower again this is the cell the poly 1 the poly 2 In this case, the situation is pretty simple. You basically apply something like 20 volts on the gate and you keep the source or, or the source and the drain at zero volts. Okay. basically le le let's see you, you you can do it uh, in this way let's say let, let, let's put two options here one option is to put vs and vd at zero volt the other option which is also used it is to put the source at zero and to keep the volt the the drain floating so you do not apply any voltage on the gate you you keep an open circuit on the drain so that you have no drain current you see, in both cases you have almost no drain current because in the first case you have zero voltage between drain and source, so you have no current. And in the second case you, let's say, separate the drain from, from the rest of the circuit so you cannot have any current from the drain. What happens here? Of course you, you have a high voltage on the gate and therefore you have a, a inversion in the channel. So you have a large channel full of electrons here. I am drawing it in red color just to signal the fact that, that we have a, a layer full of electrons. And then what happens is that you do not have current from drain to source. From source, see, uh, current goes through from drain to source. The flow of electrons, which are negative, goes from source to drain. But then you have lots of electrons here in the, in the channel that feel the fact that you have a high voltage on the gate so, so there's a force that pushes the electrons towards the gate and then the electrons directly go some of them tunnel through the dielectric uh, um, let's say following this uh, fuller nordheim tunneling which is uh, a, I don't want to enter into the detail but is a situation which occurs when you have a very high voltage on the other hand so that the field is very high and then uh, again electrons reach the poly one 
then lose energy and are stored there for a long time. Um, so from the practical point of view, the first mechanism was the first one to be introduced. The second mechanism uh, followed, actually, but as of now, the second one is the most common. So let, let me discuss a little bit the differences between the two. You can see that the second is much more efficient because actually you only move the electrons that are going to be stored. In the first mechanism, in the channel hot electron programming, you basically have to let a lot of electrons flow from source to drain and you only collect a small percentage of them in the floating gate. In the second case, you collect all the electrons in the floating gate. So for the same program operation, you need to spend a lot more energy for uh, if you want to use the first mechanism. Okay, typically 100 times the energy. Really because uh, you can see you have lots of current flowing. Okay. Um, okay, the, the other thing that one have to, has to notice is that the second mechanism is typically slower because basically you are moving electrons that are, uh, not, that, that, that are um, still. Okay? In one case you accelerate electrons and then it's easy to move them towards the gate. In the other hand, the electrons are still in the channel and then are really pulled from, uh, pulled by, by the gate voltage to the poly. This is a process which is slower and uh, I mean, for, for a given number of electrons that you want to put in the floating gate, you require a longer time. This is the reason why at the beginning only the channel hot electron mechanism were, 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 was, uh, sorry, was usable. But then when the technology improved, one, one was able to, uh, let's say, reduce the thickness of the oxide and improve the quality. And then it was possible to program with fallen order tunneling in a reasonable time. So it, it was really not a matter of choice. It was a matter of, uh, let's say, uh, the possibilities given by the technology. If you need, if you have a very thick oxide tunnel, oxi oxide to be tunneled through, then I it's only doable with channel out electrons. Otherwise, you can do it with full electron tunneling. Okay. These are the two ma basic mechanisms for the program operation. For the erase operation, uh, the situation is actually simpler okay j just to make a little bit of historical regression uh, th these memory cells when they were, uh, let's say, put in the market, were called EEPROM. EEPROM meant erasable, programmable, ROM, read-only memory. Okay. So the E was for erasable. And uh, uh, the memory was erased by put, putting the memory in an oven, in a, a in an oven with uh, ultraviolet light. Light. Okay. Be basically, you had to remove the chip from the board, put the chip in an oven, and switch on ultraviolet light. And the uh, the ultraviolet light, light was able to uh, pass through. The, the the electric layers enter into the poly pro, uh, excite the electrons which means provide energy to the electrons and then the electrons with this energy were able to move out of the poly 
So it was a good thing at, at, the, at the beginning because there were there were no other easy way to e uh, to erase a programmable ROM. But of course, it was very very uh, inconvenient from many other point of views because you really had to remove the chip from the board and to put it in the oven. So uh, this is, of course, a thing of the past, just uh, an historical regression, the, the, the digression. But then the flash memories that we use now are a descendant of the EEPROM, which is uh, the electrically erasable PROM. OK, this was UV light. U not interesting for us anymore the electrically um, erasable prom and actually it is a full or no dime erase it's very similar to the full or no dime programming with the difference that you apply different voltages on the on the device basically in that case you need to use the body contact so let me write it explicitly you have say a source here a drain here and here the control gate then you have the body contact here and this is the PL. so what's the situation here you have lots of electrons in the poly one in the floating gate that you want to remove of course you, if you want to remove electrons you need to apply a force which removes electrons so in the opposite direction as before and in order to do that you do the following you typically put zero voltage on the gate and 20 volt on the body and source and drain are floating So they are not connected to anything else so this means that you that, that the that this part the body is at the higher voltage so that you have a force on the electron which pushes the electron down again since more or less the voltage is the same as before but with the opposite direction you actually remove all the electrons here you remove them and and they, they actually recombine here in the P-well with uh, holes coming from the contact. Okay. So this is... Uh, uh, um, the basic operation actually the erase operation is uh, um, always uh, a full or an erase in the normal and uh, in the common let's say flash memories that we have now and for the reasons that i have told you now uh, you can understand that the uh, non-volatile memories are actually uh, much slower than the ram okay if you want to order the different types of memory according to speed their static rams are the faster one then you have the dynamic rams that are slower because you have to charge the capacitor which is a relatively large capacitor and then the slower e e even slower are the non-volatile memories the order is is the following in addition to that there are some architectural issues that make uh, uh, non-volatile memory um, 
even more slow that we can see now. I mentioned um, just a few minutes ago the NAND architecture and I want to discuss something about it. The, the NAND architecture is uh, uh, the most common type of architecture for flash memories now and uh, is uh, um, the most common because it's really the one that enables the maximum integration. It's the type of architecture that enables the maximum number of memory cells per square centimeter and so the maximum, let's say, memory capacity per chip. Of course, since this is a, one of the main requirements from the point of view of application, this is the reason why they are so uh, common. It's interesting to look at the architecture from our point of view because the memory is not, is, it's not just the specific device. It's also important to understand how the memory is addressed, how when you program one memory, you're not uh, actually altering the information contained in a nearby memory cells. What happens when you erase something? So l let's look at the architecture for, for a moment. In, in the NAND architecture, uh, you have, from the electrical point of view, this type of uh, situation. You have uh, it's a, a bit line in this direction, for example. Then you have a select transistor on top. Let's call it select top. Of course, you have several, you, you have an array structure. So uh, let's say uh, on the other, you have this bit line and then parallel to this, you have another bit line and another bit line and so on. And then you have the single cells and the single cells are put in series such as this. You have, for example, uh, let's call it R0, the first row. Then you have a second row. Then you have a third row. Then you have a fourth row. And for simplicity, I stop here. In modern NAND architectures, you have even 32 transistors in series. Okay, so I can stop here in, in any case. And then you have a select transistor on the bottom. That is continuing. Of course, this is an array, so you have this row that continues to the other bit line again and again and again. But I don't want to. I just want to focus on one bit line. So this is called select bottom. And then from here, you can uh, read. Let's call it, this is a diffusion region that is the source of the old chain is a source and an N plus region for the source. So let, let's assume that this is a node, okay? So uh, this is the structure from the electrical point of view. You have an array of cells, in this specific case four, in practical cases up to 32. So uh, I, I was saying from the uh, physical point of view, it's very uh, compact as a structure. Let me just show you how. So uh, the thing is that you have everything in a single P well. This is re uh, seen from the top. Uh, 
then for each row that would be a word line you have a poly 2 which crosses the P well and continues on to the other bit lines this would be the poly 2 corresponding to R0 here then you have here the poly 2 corresponding to R1 then here you have the poly 2 corresponding to R2 the poly 2 corresponding to R3 and they, this continue on then how are the um, transistor made you have the, the poly 1 below let's assume that it's here as in the, B, in, the, in, the in the in the single set that I designed previously the poly 1 here below when the information is stored and then you have the M plus region L let me use a, a green the M plus region of the uh, source and drain that goes in this direction the M plus region goes in this direction and must be connected to the bit line this is the M plus source you see so that for R3 you have the, the source and the drain here is the source and the drain the source and the drain the source and the drain of the device you do not have a contact between uh, uh, two adjacent transistors and this is good because you can pack them more closely you you essentially have only an n plus region which connects the two gate the, the two channels uh, and uh, acts as the uh, contact then everything is already done here you only need to uh, put the bit line which is a metal on top of everything for example you can in order to pack everything very closely pass it on the N plus source in the middle for example I can use the, the red color here I think the, the black color here this is the metal one the first line of metal which is the bit line and you can see here that the bit line is connected to the drain of this top transistor so it's connected to this M plus source region so here we have a real contact a, via, a vertical via through it here in this case we only miss uh, the select top and the select bottom that are not yet in the drawing but it's very easy because you only have the poly 2 and you do not have the poly 1 this is the select top basically it, it, it's exactly as the other flash memory cells with the only difference that you do not have the floating gate so this is the select top which continues on to the other bit lines and below here you have the select bottom you see drain a source of the select bottom of course you do not have the floating gate 
so it's a technology which really allows to pack everything very closely imagine what happens when you have 32 of this in line it's it's extremely packed uh, I, I hope it's clear just uh, we, we can look at the same thing from another point of view in order to be completely uh, sure. Let's look at the cross section. We can imagine that we cut this uh, top view in the middle and we look at it from the side. Okay, let's make another. This is the let me. Sh this is the top view. I will show you some picture later on but if we draw it uh, let's say one element uh, at a time it's easier to uh, let's say understand the role of everything basically uh, you have this P well which is very long and then you have the M plus region when you do the M plus region, before you implant the M plus region, you have the gate regions already there so that you really have this M plus region here. <coughs> then you have the select bottom, for example, with the poly 2. This is again the M plus region that you have the row number 3. So you have the poly 1 and the poly 2. And this is R3. Then you have M plus, and then you have uh, the other. Oops. Mm. No. So this is poly one. Then you have poly 1 and poly 2 this is R2 then you have the other M plus diffusion which acts as the drain for one transistor and as the source for the other transistor then you have R1 then you have the other M plus region then you have R0 this is R2 R1 R3 R2 R1 R0 are word lines that go <coughs> to this direction for a significant length then you have the select top here with just the poly 2 and also here you have uh, a row then you have here and then here okay I do not have much space but you have the contact for the bit line and the bit line on top of everything uh, it's not it's not easy enough, top of everything basically you have a dielectric and on the dielectric you have this bit line which goes above everything okay I only draw a part of it because I have written something but so this is the bit line which passes through the whole the whole well and then continues in this direction okay this is how it is done looking for from from different situations so you have to imagine that the fact that we have several parallel bit lines several parallel row lines lot for at each crossing you have a flash memory cell which stores one bit now uh, it's interesting to uh, un understand what happens when you want to program the memory and you do not want uh, to have uh, uh, interference between different cells let 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 us see what happens here we have one bit line, then another bit line. Here we have the select top. And then we set four transistors. And this goes also
across the other and this one this one then you have the select bottom and then you have all the rows so first we want to program let me do it something here I know it's not fair for you but I can want to do something because I need this uh, drawing later and then I copy you have to be fast then I can copy this here I never do anything strange. <laughs> yeah, too risky. It was too risky. That I can try again because I like. No. Okay, I'm not doing it. Okay. You need to understand the signs from the divine. So, <coughs> you want, we want to program. Let's assume that we want to program this one. So, what we do is the following. Uh, here we need to use for learner than tunneling because you see, you, we cannot directly access the drain and the source of the memory cells. This is something that we could do in the, in, in, for, for, for oneself, but in this case, you do not have direct access to the drain and the source. So you do something like this. You put 20 volt here, and then you put zero volt on the bit line. Okay? Then, you can typically put 20 volt on the select top, uh, which is the same actually, this goes in this direction, and then you put 5 volt on any row. Okay, let's look first at the first bit line. What, what happens here is that R1, R2, and R3, let's call it this bit line 0 and this bit line, uh, oh, not, no 0 bit line A and this bit line B on bit line A this go on because uh, let's say 5 volt is higher than the threshold voltage independent of uh, the um, programming state of these transistors so when you have a zero here basically these R1, R2, and R3 are switched on, and you have a short circuit from the select bottom to here. So you have 5 volts also here. You have a short circuit up to here. So basically, here you have ground, oh sorry, here we have ground. And then this zero is basically also here, because here you have a short circuit. The, the same happens in the other direction here you have a short circuit so you have here zero also and then you can program the memory cell because electrons tunnel from the channel to the floating gate okay in all the other cases you do not have programming because the voltage applied on the gate is too small okay so for r1 r2 and r3 you only switch the device on you do not program them because the voltage applied is too low R0 is programmed okay now there is the other issue what happens to this transistor 
you see, and to all the other transistors in the row. You do not want to program these transistors, but you have 20 volt here because it's the same word line. So the thing that you do is that you put 10 volt on the bit line so that uh, the select top uh, action, no, so you have 20 volts, so I'm, I'm, I'm wrong here, you have 20 volt also on the select bottom as on the select top. So on the select top, since uh, you have 20 volt here, this is uh, the, the transistor goes on so that you have here 10 volts, okay? These transistors below are all switched off because they have a low voltage on the on the they have a low voltage on the gate and then here you have 10 volts but it's not enough to program the cell so this is not programmed and th the same is true for all the other bit lines basically in order not to program the other cells on the same word on the cell that you want to program you increase the voltage on the bit line okay so for the other rows you have a low voltage you do not program them for the other uh, columns you have a high bit line voltage so you do not program them you need at least 20 volt to program the cell okay this is how you can program even in an array you you can program only one bit only the bit which has the bit line at zero voltage and the word line at 20 volts get programmed so and and, and of course you have all the addressing circuitry that uh, it can translate the the address uh, of the of the memory cell to the specific uh, a bias of the bit line and of the word line and essentially they are just decoders I don't want to go to, to go into a, the description of a decoder because we already know that okay now uh, the, the, it, it's tricky because one really does not have direct access to the source in the drain otherwise it would be easy it's easy when we look at one cell when we look at an array we, we need to keep that part into account let's look at what happens when you want to erase uh, to to read so this is the select and again when i want to read i need really to read only one bit So this is the bit line. Let's, let's call it A, which is the one that is of interest to me. And then we have the all the other bit lines that I do not want to address. You need to say imagine that is a very large array now what do you do basically let's assume that we want to read this one this is our zero r1 r2 r3 now we need to put five volts on the select top five volts on the select bottom because we want to switch these devices on in the other case we had to put 20 volts because we had uh, 10 volts on the bit line otherwise the, the select uh, transistors would be not would would not be switched on and then here is the thing you put five volts on all the other rows and zero on the one that you want to read and 
and then this is ah, you can you can assume that the, here you put the ground for the purpose of what we want to to say here so what what happens here is that all these transistors are switched on so that you have zero volt here these are short circuited all of them this is also short circuited so you have here the voltage that you have on the bit line and then you in order to measure this I, I, to, 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 to verify if this memory is in the one state or in the zero state you push some current through the bit line you call it essence and then what happens is the following if you, you, you can be in one of two situations if I have uh, ID versus VGS you are in one of two situations you typically do something slightly different with respect to what we said before when you have the, the normal threshold voltage is negative so when you have a logical zero you have a negative threshold voltage and when you have a logical one you have a positive threshold voltage so that when VGS is zero the voltage on the row line is zero you can have current through the device if the device is in zero if the device is on you do not have current through the device so when you push some current here what happens is that if the device is in the zero state here you have a low voltage on the bit line if the device is in the one state I mean the device the, the, the flash memory says does not allow the current to flow and the voltage on the bit line goes high so that you can sense the voltage on the bit line okay so push e sense on the bit line and then if bit line voltage low it was a zero if bit line voltage high means a one okay and in principle you can read the whole word line in this way because you can push the same current through all the bit lines and then you can read the the, the, um, the information on all the cells in the same row because all, all the measurements are independent okay so the reading operation can be uh, nice uh, nicely done in parallel it's not very fast uh, because you have all these transistors in series so you have some resistance through the path of the current so the, the, the reading procedure is not extremely fast as in an SRAM for example but still it's pretty convenient okay to conclude on this issue let's look what happens when you want to erase erase is the most complicated aspect here erase operation is complicated on the one hand on the other hand it's easy in the sense that it cannot be done so let me show you why select top first row is here 
I want to go a little bit into the details because this have an effect on the performance and on the type of use of the uh, flash memory cells. You can see as of now why they are so uh, dense and why they are so slow. And this is an additional reason. So we want to erase. There's a problem with erase. The problem with erase is that, again, you, you ca you're not able to erase one single cell. There's no way. Because you, you cannot really ad address a single transistor and, uh, let's say, leave all the other transistors um, uh, unchanged. So what one typically does is the following thing. One erase a whole array at the same time, a complete sector, actually. So one has to put 20 volts here, 20 volts here. Uh, sorry, 0, 0, 0, 0. The select top is uh, 0 again. The select bottom is 0. This is floating, so this is floating, and the bit line also is floating, so there's no current through it. We do exactly the same that we did uh, for explaining the erase through Follinger dime, and then one increases the voltage on the body, which is not shown here. You know that uh, I, I can use a red color. Typically, the body is is drawn by uh, um, by putting this type of fourth electrode or oh, see the, the body uh, is uh, the p well contact so is the same because we have a unique p well for the whole bit line and then you put 20 volt here on the body and also here you put 20 volt on the body And in this way, you completely erase a sector. If you can see, if you, want, if you do not want to erase a line, you just need to leave the body voltage at zero. But at least you have to, re to erase a complete array. In this case, the array is just four transistors, but it can be 32. Okay, if you leave, uh, let me repeat again, if you leave the body voltage at zero, of course, you leave the array unchanged. If you put 20 volt on the body, then you erase everything because when you put this 20 volt, you remove all the electrons from the floating gate and you push them in the body, okay? So actually what happens when we write on a flash memory? The, the following thing happens, when you write a one, only one bit cell is addressed and let's say you, you write exactly one. That's it. When you want to switch a one into a zero, it's a more complex procedure. Basically, you have first to erase everything and then to rewrite all the ones. Okay? And this is something that adds to the uh, let's say the slowness, no? the, 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 the low speed of flash memories. In many cases, especially for the newest generation, you do not notice it. You know, if, if you have, a, well, sometimes if you have a USB 3 a memory stick, you do not notice it. If you have a hard disk, a solid state disk drive, you do not notice how slow it is. Because the, the, the thing is that in addition to this part, which is the essential, let's say, mechanism of the, of the flash memory cells, you have a complete microprocessor or uh, at least uh, in some cases a, a complex finite state machine that acts as the interface for you. And basically, it gets the data that you want to program in the, in the memory and then in the background does all the operations to erase the complete array and rewrite all the, all the ones. 
and for the solid state disk you typically have a microcontroller in there to to do this operation and you have a, a large cache so that you don't notice anything okay and this is the le let's say the complexity of the technology underneath the solid state disks okay you do not notice all the complexity that and and the the slowness of the, of, of the process because you have a fast interface and you have large caches okay so so I, I of course I don't want to to to, to d discuss that part but the difference between uh, the the, s the, uh, the apparent speed of different types of uh, uh, flash memories of cartridges of uh, sticks etc is mostly due to the to the this uh, finite state machine at the interface or a microprocessor at the interface because in, in, in the background the essentially memory cells are typically is, I mean th the same type of cells so they are slow in all the cases and it's it's hard to make them faster because of this 10 year requirement if you want a 10-year requirement uh, for the retention, then you need an oxide thickness, which is at least 7 nanometers, okay? Because otherwise you do not have this 10-year retention time. And if you have a thickness of the oxide of 7 nanometers, it's slow. You, can, you, you could have a faster memory cell with a smaller thickness of the oxide, but then you should let's say, accept a retention time of something like, let's say, a month, not 10 years. So these are really commercial trade-offs. For, for lots, for, for, for many years, people have uh, tried to understand if there was a space in the memory market for some memory devices with a smaller retention but uh, faster speed. But then as of now, the, the market is segmented as in the, in, in the way that I've shown you. You have still SRAM, DRAM, and Flash, and you only use Flash for, for uh, uh, large-scale storage, uh, for mass storage, because they are slow. Uh, 